I learned something from Buddhism that's been very useful to me. Uh, that meditation is a practice and that religion, is, what, what religion is, is a practice. It's something you do. Somebody asked their meditation, Buddhist meditation teacher, <clears throat> whether the practice of meditation caused enlightenment. And the teacher said, no, enlightenment is an accident. <laughs> but meditation makes you more accident prone. <laughs> Which was very much rem reminiscent of the Tillich paper that made it clear that grace was a happening that happened or didn't happen. That's a clue, I think, as to what religion is. Uh, religion is a practice that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Uh, when I was pastor of a local church, <clears throat> I gave sermons uh, that some days people left out the back door just glowing with new enthusiasm or something, you know. And there were other days when I gave sermons and they just felt like dead lead on the... Uh, sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't, you know. You never know whether your religious practice is going to bring about a new kind of experience of profound humanness or whether it's just going to be religious practice. It just didn't work that day, either for you weren't ready for it or the practice had become obsolete or you don't know probably what happened, but at any rate, that's the nature of religion. Its purpose is to help you access your profound humanness, if it's a good religion. Uh, but accessing profound humanness is always a grace happening, an accident uh, that you cannot control or predict with your religion. That's very important. It reminds me of the closing scenes of the little big man movie where the old Indian chief goes to the top of the mountain to build, do his death ritual. It's time for him to die. So he goes up to the top of the mountain with a little big man accompanying him. <coughs> he lays out and goes through all of his uh, Native American rituals, uh, expecting his soul to be taken off. Uh, but it doesn't happen. It just starts drizzling on him. And uh, finally he gets up and says, sometimes the magic works and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> and they go back down the hill uh, to, to live a while longer. <laughs> well, that's, that's an insight in religion I have not forgotten. This chart is a chart related to the other two charts. We, we studied this in the last session that associates a religious practice, a type of religious practice, with each of these uh, states of consciousness or states of, of all. For example, the profound dialogue practice relates to helping you access your, your transparent attention, your beyond knowing, your interior uh, watching. Uh, what the practice of profound dialogue amounts to is recognizing that you have inside your being all the great minds, all the great persons in your life, maybe your parent, maybe your teachers, uh, maybe people you've read, that, that this reside there as a counsel of advice, reside there as people who speak to you about your life issues. So everybody has this interior counsel. And the practice is to take charge of that counsel, to recognize these are valuable voices, all the great people that have addressed your life in some way or another, exemplified it, gave you ways of living, showed you things. Uh, to take charge of your counsel means to decide who are the most important ones for people to listen to. <laughs> Put them on the front row of your counsel. Uh, maybe you organize your counsel by types of uh, people and on types of subject matter that you have one counsel for this, one counsel for this, one counsel for that. Uh, but the discipline is to realize that not only do you listen to these great voices in, you've acquired in your lifetime, but also you can speak back. Uh, you can argue with them. You can dismiss them from your counsel entirely if they become voices you no longer need to hear. Uh, so this is, a, this is the practice, is to recognize that interior counsel and, and construct your dialogue with it. And that's a lot of what we do when we do meditative readings and, and dialogue with the scriptures and 
and read the great theologians and, and loose links of that nature. So it's inner dialogue with Paul Tillich and, and Rudolf Bultmann and A.H. Almas and Martin Luther and <laughs> Jesus and the Buddha and whoever's on your inner council of persons that have uh, already in interfered with your life. Foundational meditation is about uh, the kind of thing we did in the early s sessions of really being conscious of our consciousness. Uh, so whether it's uh, meditating, as the Buddhists tend to meditate with concentration on the breath, and concentration on your being a powerful, noticing person. One of the great gifts of meditation, uh, as the Buddhists pioneered it, was to access that courageous heart, that autonomous strength, uh, uh, that love of self, that invincible. Uh, so though there's a certain association between uh, an autonomous strength and the practice of meditation, a foundational meditation. <clears throat> then persistent intentions uh, helps you access your profound merging, your freedom, your basic freedom. Uh, we've, in the Christian faith, called that prayer. Uh, and it's very helpful to understand what prayer is as persistent intentions. Uh, Christianity created four different types of prayer recognize four different types of prayer. Confession, gratitude, petition, and intercession. Confessionary prayer means the intention of owning up to what's going on in your life. Owning up to uh, ways you've failed to live, and ways you've lived that's made sense and need to be pursued. Uh, confession, owning up. Gratitude is a kind of intention that has to do with acknowledgement of the goodness of life itself, uh, both in its great pleasurable and wonder-filling experiences, but even the experiences you wouldn't have asked for for the world, uh, still a, a deep sense of gratitude is being able to take in those uh, horrifying and, and demanding kinds of moments uh, with a, a deeper type or at least another type of, of gratitude. So that the intention of being grateful in spite of all comers, it is a practice of this uh, persistent intentions. And petitions means really asking for what you want, asking what you believe you need. Uh, it's being aggressive about getting for yourself what you really do feel would be fulfilling. Uh, so don't feel uncomfortable asking. To, to acknowledge what you want and ask for it uh, is a, doesn't mean you're going to get it. <laughs> but, to, but to ask, uh, to aggressively go for, uh, imaginally, puts you in the space of being ready for it when it comes, if it comes. Uh, so it's a powerful thing to be persistently uh, acknowledging what you want for your life, what you want for uh, yourself and becoming your best self and so on. So prayer of the petitionary sort is a very helpful practice and may have the accident of bringing you into places you wouldn't have been gone without it. And intercession is, is applying that same kind of principle to other people. Uh, people who are important to you, uh, ask, ask, ask for what they need. Uh, this is not going to magically bring it. Uh, you're not going to magically convert your most horrifying enemies by praying for uh, their conversion or whatever. Uh, but it will put you in a place where you have opportunities to speak to that person or do something with that person. Uh, it puts you in a place of readiness to be the person they need uh, in your relationships to them. Uh, and no matter who you're praying for, it puts you in a position of being ready for anybody. Uh, if you're praying for the planet, uh, we'll learn how to take care of it. It puts you in the position to vote the way you need to vote when you come to time to vote or whatever else happens to you. So this persistent intentions is accessing your profound freedom in the best case scenario. It may not work, but sometimes the magic works that uh, a prayer life brings you in touch with your freedom and with the ability to be interiorly initiative 
uh, in the midst of things that were going to happen to you. So people who practice uh, ongoing powerful prayer life or what you might say programming their interior computer to be ready for opportunities to be that freedom that you're practicing. So you kind of get the association there. Now on the top, this has more to do with being with other people, kind of practice you, you do together more than alone. Those three practices are, are more lonely, uh, singular, uh, solitary practices. But the next three, the top three, are more practices of group practice. For example, the holistic detachment well, it has a lot to do with joining a religious order or something of that nature or, or getting simplified living uh, structured for yourself in such a way that, that your fo focus has become primary. That was the, the advantage of having religious orders, I think, was that it really focused your vocational contribution. It really puts you in a place of being able to do what the general society could not do because it was too locked into all the patterns of the general society. So to pull out of that general society, create an order of mission that got things done that weren't normally done, was a great gift to, to civilization. But it's a great lift to uh, realize just plain simple fact that economic pros pros prosperity is not the only game going. Uh, becoming a successful human being is a deeper and more important game that it makes you happy with or without the uh, ideal prosperity. It's not anything to do with a depreciation of prosperity or the need for e economic well-being, but it's getting things straight. So the practice of simplicity living, the practice of holistic detachment, as it's called here, uh, is a corporate practice uh, that's been very useful in the history of mankind. Devotional singularity is a practice relating to uh, outflowing compassion. It has to do with a cultural discipline. All of us have that opportunity to, with some practice designed by a larger group of people, to be devotional. Uh, I think that's the, the purpose, in my view, of organizing circles of, of uh, intimacy is uh, to practice caring for one another and practice being a team care for the parish or region of humanity in which you live. Uh, just that practice of being ready to do things together that need to be done, that practice of caring for each other in very mundane but very spiritual also ways, uh, this the practice of just setting aside one day a week, by God, I'm going to meet with this group of people and we're going to take care of each other. That is a deep, wonderful practice uh, that has long-range complications on your life, <laughs> long-range gifts to your life, in the area of outflowing compassion. Uh, to be outflowing compassion by practice with uh, dying people uh, prepares you to be outflowing compassion with the planet as, as, as a whole. Uh, then historical engagement. This may not seem like a religious practice, but the illustration that convinced me it is is walking the streets of Jackson, Mississippi uh, with Martin Luther King. Uh, I had the opportunity back in those days to be an active part of the civil rights movement, and one of those active parts was walking down those Jackson streets, which were, you know, policed by racial bigots <laughs> of the highest order. <laughs> And those, oh, you looked at, at the danger of it. Of course, there was a lot of people. There was actually no danger to me, really, but uh, I felt the power of it anyway. And you pass those people on the streets, uh, some sitting on their porches, uh, hating you, and others cheering you on uh, as you walk down their street. Uh, that, to me, was a religious practice. Uh, it was accident prone, <laughs> making me accident prone to be a. Uh, a, a different human being, to take more seriously attuned working in the times in which I lived, uh, working beyond fate with the possibility of revolutionizing my society, uh, obedient uh, liberation, uh, intentionality. Anyway, those kind of practices are options that the human community has invented to help us on our journey. These next two are, are 
a little more profound in some ways, the next three, I mean, the ones across the middle. Let's look first at boundless inquiry. How many of you have kept a journal at one time in your life? A diary or a journal, either one, okay. Well, that's a practice of boundless inquiry. I mean, what you're doing, you're writing down things that have to do with your life and reflecting on them more fully. Uh, and there's no question of what taking a journal uh, can be a very helpful and making you accident prone to access your history and future and present uh, more, more fully. And if you're meditating on all kinds of people, as you often do in your journal, your relationship to them or, or your concern for them and, or sometimes an analysis of them, <laughs> whatever you're writing down, uh, you're, you're probably helping yourself uh, to live beyond desperation into a kind of forgiveness or acceptance of yourself and others uh, as they appear uh, in your specific life. Uh, so I've put this boundless inquiry practice in relationship to uh, that particular state of being. It's true that all these practices relate to all these states of beings, but uh, in this chart, it's, I kind of see these associations. Or, or what I'm really seeing, I think, is that the humanity has invented religious practices that help you with each one of these various uh, aspects of our pr profound humanness. Then let's look over here at a full-bodied exformation. Now that's a new one for me. Uh, Joyce and I had the privilege of making some real contact with a woman who organized a uh, practice called inter interplay, interplay, uh, helping us, what she called X form, to make up for all the inform. That she grasped the fact that we are overloaded with information and need to do some X formation. We need to get our, what we do know, out there in, in a practice that uh, uh, helps us be outgoing as well as ingoing. So instead of information, uh, she wants us to do full-bodied exformation. She was a dancer who also became a Methodist preacher. And uh, in that role, she tried to use some of her dance experience to dance religion in her congregation. They didn't like it. Uh, they literally uh, felt her, felt like the, this profession of clergyman was not what she wanted. So she and a, another man, a very creative man, not her married partner, but her business partner, organized this movement, uh, Interplay. If you ever hear of an Interplay meeting, you might enjoy to go to it. Now in the very middle there uh, is, I had to put down here at the bottom, the practice of visionary trance. You see that down there at the bottom? That's talking about a practice of religion that relates to the enchantment with being or love of reality as a whole. And this is a hard one to, uh, to communicate because it's the most weird sounding to, to modern people like us. But it wasn't weird in the history of humanity. The shaman of ancient, ancient times took people on quests, on vision tribes, on vision journeys. Uh, like they went out of their minds. Sometimes they used drugs to get there. Uh, some of them used intentional drumming until you just, or dancing, until you just went someplace, you know, into another space uh, and came back again. Uh, or this appeared in the Holy Rollers uh, and Shakers and Quakers of Christian tradition uh, that you just found this out of your mind, states that, that came into being as a practice, which uh, allowed you to get out of your mind, basically, <laughs> into uh, something deeper. Uh, and not just be, yeah, locked into uh, blinders with life. There are things you do probably have done, uh, if these sound a little weird, uh, that are also uh, visionary trance practices, like laughter. Sometimes just having a laugh face, face and there's, there is a practice where you lay on each other's stomachs and go ha-ha and ha-ha until finally everybody is ha-hawing so that it's just a, outlandish outside your mind experience of just being in a laughter fest. Probably some of you have done something like this. Or a song fest. Also sometimes do this. You have to be sung about the third Negro spiritual, black spiritual, uh, or you might go someplace, you know, and into a genuine uh, musical trance. Uh, 
and come back again to your life uh, and, and, and more accident prone for enchantment with being. <laughs> you get that feeling. Another thing is, is chants. Some of these ancient Hindu chants uh, were just unbelievably uh, trance uh, performing. Just a religious retreat can be a kind of visionary trance experience as a whole, because you get away from life for three days, four days, five days, six days. When you go back, you know you've been somewhere. There's an re-entry re -entry problem. <laughs> Sometimes good treat, treat leaders prepare you for re-entry, making it clear to you, you, you've been in trance space here for six days. You're going home again to the same old stuff you were, but you're not the same person you were, and you should expect uh, some re-entry quick struggle as you leave the retreat and go back to your normal life. So all those are illustrations of the practice of uh, visionary trance is that religion is a practice. It is something you do. Now there's theoretics and thinking that goes along with these practices, but basically you do religion. It's, it's not that you just think new thoughts. You do something. Uh, you practice something. Uh, you, the intellectual part is, informs and is part of the practice, but it's not the essence of religion. To have a philosophy of life is not the essence of religion. The essence of religion is to practice, 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 practice. Every week, every day, you know, you do something. Every year you do something, it's a practice. That's a revolution for me to get that really clear. Uh, and the practice doesn't always work. Uh, you come to three Sunday night meetings of your little circle and you haven't gone to heaven yet, you just give up. <laughs> but you gave up too soon because the fourth and fifth was heavenly trip. Uh, it just, sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't. So we have to keep at this practice until the intent of the practice does its job or does you or whatever it needs to do to make the, uh, what you're after happen. Uh, so that's a very important uh, understanding of religion.